here we are at an undisclosed location with a couple of snowmobile race legends. You guys know Tommy, but in the middle here is Paul Groth of Bud Snow King fame. And uh, Paul's got a really, really cool sled to show us today. All right, Paul, should we, should we show him the sled or do you wanna explain what it is first? Um, the sled belongs to Brad Warning. Uh, he commissioned several people to help him build it. I built the engine for this uh, machine. And uh, yeah, it's very unique. Um, it's the only five-cylinder radial engine snowmobile that I know of. And I built the engine completely from scratch. The only thing I used was the original cylinders for a 77 Kawasaki 440 Snow Pro. And uh, it's right behind me. Wow, I didn't realize those are Snow Pro cylinders. That's awesome. Here's the sled, folks. Here's the sled. And uh, a little later, stay tuned to the video because you're going to hear this run a little later. So, Paul, um, being a two-stroke but with five pistons radially displaced, I'm, I'm assuming, am I correct when I think there's one crank throw? Yes. All, well, how do you have them on one crank throw? They, because you have one master rod. Okay. And you have four link rods that connect to that master rod. What? Yeah. They're all perfectly in line. And yeah, there's there's one crank throw. It has the it has the stock uh stroke from uh, a 440. Okay. I think it's right around 60 millimeters, I think they are. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, there's there's one it's quite a heavy duty unit. Yeah. The, the master rod is on cylinder number 1. And that's how they fire. One, two, three, four, five. Really? Yeah. And so is it scavenged through the crankcase like a normal two-stroke? No, it is not. How is this, how is this scav? When I say scavenged, if you don't know what I'm talking about, we're talking about how does the fuel get from the carburetor to the cylinder? Mostly magic. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, the fuel goes through the, comes through the carburetor into the intake manifold. Okay. And I can show you that, but it, a lot of it's covered up. Yeah. This is, the, this is the intake manifold, the intake manifold for the supercharger. Okay. So it goes down around, the supercharger is underneath here. It's off of a 2.3 Mercedes. Okay. And that far, forces all the air and fuel into the crankcase from below. There's windows in the bottom in the bottom half of this uh, cover, yeah, there's windows in there, and the blower manifold matches up to them. It's all O-ringed, and so just a little bit like an old Detroit diesel two-stroke, where it needed the supercharger to push Sa the, the charge. The same principle. Same principle. It won't run without the supercharger. Gotcha. The supercharger is not there to uh, enhance the power. It's just to make the normal power. Or you can tweak it a little bit, and I think I'm my I'm running it right around eight pounds of okay. boost. So eight pounds of boost, yeah, that's about that's about normal because normal crankcase pressure would be right around there six to eight or yeah. something like that, depending on the crankcase, of course. But this has got a very good good sized crankcase in it. Um, the the crankcase is made out of um, twelve inch aluminum tubing with one inch thickness on it. Wow. And uh, so Paul, you designed all this. Did you do most of the machine work yourself as well? I did, yes. Oh, the only thing I didn't do myself was letter it because I don't, I didn't have the capabilities on the CNC to, to do that at the time. Sure. But a friend of mine did this cover and uh, we, this logo is on all the Kawasaki aircraft and on the, some of the Kawasaki parts. Uh, if you ever look on the Kawasaki, uh, like for a piston or something, you'll see this little flag with the Kawasaki emblem on it. Hmm. And, and it was Kawasaki aircraft to start with. Remember back in World War II when the Kates and the Zeros were kind of flying around? Yeah. Not, not that old. I'm not that old, but I've seen it. Make it I've well, seen it on TV. I, neither am I, but they're making a lot of trouble. Yeah. And 
One of them said Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi on the engine, yeah. and the other one said Kawasaki. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> wow. So I didn't know that. So Kawasaki has been big into aircraft before they broke out into motorcycles, snowmobiles. So, Paul, Paul, I see it's styled after the Kawasaki Shark, and we know those were all crushed. Yes. But are these shark cylinders that you have on here? These are original Kawasaki Shark cylinders. Brad, Brad Warning, he, they sourced them. These guys got their, their hands all over. You know, their network's really good for vintage stuff. Yeah. Especially race stuff. Mm hmm And they found, when, when the guys came in, uh... In 77, they had 10 of these sleds ready to go out on the circuit. Kawasaki came in and took them all, crushed them, so nobody would get the technology, you know. And then they left with their big trucks, and, and here we go. And the guys in the shop are going, you know, what the heck? And they went into the dino room, and they forgot that they had a ton of parts in the dino room. So they had extra cylinders, they had extra engines, you know, dyno mules and whatever. Yeah. But all that stuff, the guys just kind of filled their trunks and went home. And Brad found a guy that had, had uh, I think, two or three engines and a bunch of cylinders for a 77 Snow Pro. And he... The guy was scared to do anything with him because he had him for 30 years, you know. Yeah. Anyway, he sold him to Brad. Brad commissioned, I think, three of these chassis to be made. And Miss Al, Al Eno from uh, North Dakota. Sure. What is it called? It's uh, Snow Pro Unlimited. Yeah. He fabricated the entire chassis and, okay. and made the buck and made the fiberglass hoods. No kidding. And so Brad has got a 340 and a 440, and he might have another one. I don't know. But uh, he brought one uh, a, a blank chassis and a hood down to me, and he wanted he wanted me to put a four-cylinder Kawasaki street bike engine in there. Yeah. Okay. And I said, yeah, that, no big deal. We can do that. And so uh, he went to a couple of shows in between there. And he, he got disillusioned. He said, ah, everybody's got a 750 Honda in there. They've got, you know, they, everybody's got a bike engine. There's nothing new. And I said, how about a radial engine? Like an airplane? Yeah. Oh, I love airplanes. And Brad's a big aircraft fanatic. So he says, where can we get a radial to fit in there? And I go, I'll make you one. <laughs> you know, put your foot in your mouth. But... <laughs> But I'd, I'd had, I've had a radial engine design in my head for about, at that time, for about 20 years. So, And I never had the, the means or the, the money to put it together. Right. So, and uh, I'm grateful to Brad and, and the Warning family in general has given me great opportunity to, you know, to explore what I can do. You yeah, know, yeah, I, the Warning. I know, I know what I can do, but... You know, they're wonderful for the entire sport and for preserving all those very vehicles. Much so, very much so. Uh, but, very grateful that they're, yeah. they've taken that upon themselves to do but that. But the design is not taken from anybody. The only thing that's similar to a regular radial engine is how the crankshaft works. And but, I saw, and I at Oshkosh during the big air show there at Oshkosh, I went through the museum and I saw how a big radial aircraft engine worked. Yeah. Oh, okay. What the heck? You know. Does it work that way with the master rod? Yeah. Really? All, all the same. You know, you can have seven or nine or five. They're always odd numbers on a radial because the uh, the crankshaft, if you're even cylinders, it tends to get a harmonic vibration in them. Sure. And they're not perfectly balanced anyway. And uh, well, with the odd number of cylinders firing. They run, they run pretty good. So, that's so cool. Yeah, that's so cool. I can show you, basically, how it works on the bench here if you want to. I'd love to see that. Okay. Yeah, you want to take us over? Sure. So, this okay. is not. Ex 
Let me try to get this up so we can get a look down on it. Okay, so now this is not exactly how, how it is, but I'm trying to convey how I did it. Okay. So this would be the master rod. Yeah. Okay. And you'd have needle bearings here. You'd have needle bearings up here, just like you would on a regular snowmobile crankshaft. Yep. Now, it, you fasten five of these link rods on there, or four. You have one here, one there, one there. That makes a five cylinder. And I machined the, the bottom end so that it would overlap all these top and bottom and a pin and a needle bearing. So I use uh, the needle bearing that went in here fits in here. So Paul, you, you made your own connecting rods. I built the, the connecting rods, I built the crankshaft, I built the crankcases, the end covers. The, the only Whatever other... you see there except for the Kawasaki cylinders, you know, is billet, it's heavy, <laughs> and yeah, it's all original. Yeah. There's no, there's no, uh, what am I trying to say? There's no uh, uh, design out there like this. Uh, there are two-stroke radials, mm -hmm. and but they they use they use a valve, and they use uh, the engines actually spin with the propeller. Sure. The, the gnome and stuff like that radials, but they're a little different. Um, this one right here. These these are all made with uh, uh, 40, 4340 steel. I just started out with a big bar stock, and you know you whittle out whatever isn't a connecting rod. So Paul, Paul I got to compare you to this other racer I, I've heard of, Burt Monroe. You're you're <laughs> you're doing some real Burt Monroe level fabrication well, here. If not see if before. I got a little bit of Chevy and a little <laughs> bit of Ford. Yeah, yeah. Now I saw that show and that yeah. I can, I can relate to that guy. I bet you but, can. Yeah. Better than anybody else on the planet, yeah. I'd say. <laughs> but uh, there's no drawings. There's no uh, blueprints, unfortunately. I, I think I did give all, the, all my scribble notes to Brad, along with the, you know, parts bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Wow. That, yeah, the, that is the, incredible. These, these are my, if I'm building something, these are my notes neat yeah i mean this is how i this is how i think i think in 3d yeah and for somebody to like make the part you have to have a, a regular uh three-dimensional drawing oh yeah but but this is how and, and this right here is for a different radial engine that i'm working on right now well we should do you want to show anything about that we can talk about that later maybe maybe All we right. should keep going with with this, yeah, this, absolutely. This, this is the star of the show here. And it is. This is what I came here for. Yeah. There will be an episode two, I think. There might be. <laughs> <laughs> there might be more than that, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. So as this goes around, you can see how everybody would be. They, they'd all be happy. I'm, I'm fascinated. That idea never occurred to me. I I thought you had to stack the connecting rods. And, on a and, common crank pin. And in fact, this connecting rod is this is out of that. Oh, really? Yeah. This one here is the one I made out of 4340 bar stock. Did did yeah. you harden it, grind it, it, it all that? It was it was induction hardened on the on the pin sides. Neat. And then honed, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you guys know I've got this thing about hones and as I walk this around Paul's shop. This one right here was an oops because it Oh, sure. The mill went negative instead of positive. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I just kept it for a keepsake, you know. You polish it up and, yeah, it's kind of cool. That's you know, fascinating. It's a one-off. <laughs> fascinating. That All right, so Paul's got the hood off here. and Okay. Paul's going to start walking us through this. Okay, I don't know where to start. Um, there's so many systems that are on this machine and then of course you know they're all unique to this machine so yeah um we can start with the uh, intake okay so, so here we have we have the uh, velocity stacks that go into two 44 millimeter macunis and i recently just put these on uh, brad bought a complete set of carbs and boots and cables 
from the Wall Brothers, and they sent them right directly to me. I installed them. I had to do a little jetting on them right now. It's good enough to run. Brad wants it to be able to be ridden around uh, like a show or something like that and be able to drive it and run and show people that it actually is a working snowmobile. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the fuel goes in to the carburetor manifold into the intake manifold. Mm -hmm. Now, the intake manifold curves around. You'll have to get it from the other side. Yeah, let me go back over here. Okay, so fuel comes in here, goes around here, and then into the blower. Okay, I'll probably have to zoom in on that so they can at least see the fins on the body of the blower. Hold it on. does look like a blower. Okay. Here you can see a little better. You can you can see the fins. You can see the where the ends of the caps are on the shafts for the blower. Right. Yeah. Now that's a blower off of a off of a 2.3 Mercedes. Um, so the way I figured out how much how much blower do you need for an engine? Now, a four-stroke only fires every other time. Mm -hmm. So you're not using all that air. You're not using the displacement of the engine every time it turns. Right. So on this one, a 2.3 is for four-stroke. This is an 1,100cc two-stroke. It's about half of what. And so I figured if I can get enough boost... To fill that crankcase, every revolution, it will be able to scavenge through the through the crankcase like a normal two-stroke. It just won't be using piston compression. It's using blower compression, you know, right. a screw-type blower. So anyway, it goes in there into the blower from the side, and then it exits in the back. And in the back... You can see the, the blower is there. Right down here is the blower manifold, and that goes up into the bottom of the crankcase. There's another cap on the end, end cap on that crankcase, similar to what's on here, but there's windows. It's O-ringed. It blows all that charge right up into the crankcase and mixes it in, and away we go. Paul, I, I got to ask, how are you making the 90-degree turn there? Because Where's the 90? That's what I'm wondering because your shaft, your clutch is on is horizontal and your oh, crank for the cylinders is for the, vertical. For the drive. Oh. Yeah. For the drive. Yeah, we were talking. Okay. Sorry, I was, I'm just, all of a sudden I okay, realized. Yeah. The crankshaft. <laughs> this is, the crank these things shaft, are not in line. <laughs> no, the crankshaft, it runs vertical. Yeah. And so the output shaft goes into an industrial gearbox, which is a T a T drive. Okay. So it goes into a shaft. It has, you know, helical gears in it. It's heavy duty gearbox filled with oil. Um, one shaft comes out and hooks to the clutch and I made an, an adapter and bearings and stuff to hold everything in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have our, our normal snowmobile clutch. Kind of normal, Paul. I noticed it's got one more weight than I, I typically deal with. Well, it is a it's it's a 108 Comet. It's a heavier duty. It's more of a race type clutch, but you've got 1100 cc's here. This thing should make close to 200 horsepower. Wow! So you need something that's going to hold it up. So, but uh, anyway, so the charge goes up into there, and from there out to the cylinders. And there's only a few cylinders at a time that have the port open, so away we go. That's you know? so cool. Yeah. And then is the blower, the reason you did a T-drive instead of a 90 is to drive the blower, I'm guessing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can't really see that, but I, is there a, there's a belt in there for the blower drive, I guess. Well, yeah, there's the pulley right there for the blower. Sure. And there's another pulley down here. And that runs the, uh, okay, this runs the blower. Okay. This, this, is, this is the end of the crankshaft here, mm -hmm. or the, the gearbox shaft. Mm -hmm. And that drives the blower. Uh, it's about a two-to-one ratio on there. I figured if, it, if it's going to distribute 1,100 cc's of air, mm -hmm. that's just dead air. Right. 
so I doubled it up. It's pushing about another, you know, another atmosphere. So we're it's not quite one one atmosphere. We're talking, talking about eight pounds of boost. Mm -hmm. So, but then behind that is another pulley and a drive for the water pump. Okay. So we have all that, and you can, as you can see, there's plenty of water. This is a liquid cooled engine. I have all the water lines, two lines. In one in one out for each cylinder, and uh, it goes through a radiator in the front. There's no cooling. Um, what do you call them? Tunnel coolers on oh, this. Yeah, yeah sure. there's no tunnel coolers or running board coolers on this at this time. Uh, that can be plumbed in later, but this thing is getting filled up. You know, so. Hmm. But yeah, you have your disc brake, and then uh, uh, charging system. Um, there's. Uh, there's a rectifier and regulators. There's two of them here. Mm -hmm. um, underneath this cover is a Kawasaki 440 flywheel and, and the uh, stator plate. Okay. Okay. It has a lighting coil on one side, and then it used to have CDI coils on the other side. Mm -hmm. So I threw them out, put another lighting coil in there. So it has two lighting coils running off of that, that stator. And all the all the wiring and stuff comes down through there to keep this battery charged. So where's where are you triggering the the crank from then? Okay, the the top of the uh, this cover right here. If I pull that off, there's uh, we went through we went through hell on this deal. Um, I was at I was at the uh, Chicago NHRA race, and me and Brad were discussing and. And I, I, I'm kind of halfway through this thing. I got to find an ignition system for this. And um, we went to MSD. You know, they all have their trailers at the races. MSD and, you know, Mallory and all that. And I said, do you have anything I can configure for a five-cylinder? Well, we don't make that. No, I know you don't. Can you configure them for a five-cylinder engine? Well... What's it for? And I, yeah, you can go kind of try to explain to them, but <laughs> and they say, no, we can't. And you, nobody there can figure this out. No, okay. Anyway, I got a little disillusioned. I thought about uh, putting in a distributor off of a Audi or something there. You got a five cylinder Audi, and ah, it would be kind of cobbly. I, I built a, a rotor with one magnet in it, mm -hmm. and I've got five electronic pickups for an electronic uh, conversion for like a 57 Chevy where you pull the points out and you put this in there, yeah. you know, and you got a little ma flying magnets to yeah. trigger it. Yeah. yeah, I got that in here. There's five of them. <laughs> That's so, awesome. So, yeah, and it, yeah, as simple as hell, and it works. There's, no, there's not much for an advanced curve or anything fancy, but it fires at 20 degrees before top dead center on each cylinder. What else do you need? That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome, Paul. So, yeah, so all this, and then everybody always says, wow, is that for oil? Everybody is drawn to this stupid little <laughs> stainless tube, you know, because it's got some nice fittings and stuff. I said, no, that's where all the wiring goes for my charging system and for my uh well, Paul, that's the, that's the ignition. that shows the detail that you work to. Most people would just have wires coming out in a split loom right there, and and you build this beautiful well, stainless steel tube to to hide all the wiring. Well, you know, you it know. was going to be for show, so you know you got to make it at least presentable. So all this talk you have is everything's heavy duty. How much does this weigh? That engine weighs over two hundred pounds. Yes. Yeah. I don't know what the whole sled weighs. Something that heavy on the skis, it must steer pretty hard. It steers really hard. And Brad expressed to me, that's why it's in my shop right now. I mean, I, we built this. I started this in 06, 07. We finished it up right around. I, I worked on it for two years. And Brad took it back and then had uh, the, the hood fitted properly. They brought me a... a you know, uh, a stock hood, and and I'm going, I had it sawed all to hell, you know, it's just so I could get it on there. 
Yeah. And Brad said, yeah, that don't look very good. And so they took it and configured it into three pieces. So it looks very nice. I mean, I'm an engine guy. I, I don't be, do paint and body. <laughs> I, I'm 100% with you there, Paul. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it, it, it steers really hard. So um, I got to look and I got to put, he said he wanted power steering on it. So they make electric power steering for ATVs and, and cars and side-by-sides and whatever. And there's no room in that shaft. It goes down in there and into a couple of knuckles or whatever. And then the shaft goes right underneath the engine, about this far underneath the engine. You can't, you can see the shaft, but you can't even get to it. So the, sh the steering shaft came out right down right down in here sure you know it, it's it's barely visible anyway it couples in to this atv steering unit you know and atvs are made to steer just like this yep so um the shaft comes in this is mounted very rigidly to the chassis mm -hmm. um i had to uh cut out some of the uh the triangulation but i put in curved to go around around the power steering unit so it it's still structurally sound mm -hmm. and then on the output shaft here i just used the plate and the steering for um, what they had on it before hmm. yeah. it looks great paul yeah but brad's a big aircraft uh, you know fanatic and he wanted some aircraft gauges to go in the in the dash oh we better have a look at that yeah so down here is a directional gyro it's not working but it's it's there and then there's a there's a clock uh, that came out of my 46 air coupe uh, airplane wow and there's an airspeed indicator does and that work goes, yeah <laughs> yeah the pitot tube is up front oh really yeah it wasn't hooked up but i figured you know, if you're going to put it in there, you better hook it up. That's so, cool. So we hook that up. And uh, master switch is here. Now, I can steer it almost. Turn the light, turn that on, and then, yeah, it just steers easy and cool. Went over center, I think. I'll have, to, I'll have to do some adjusting on there, but yeah. Paul, this is just fantastic. Yeah. That is so cool. And then that little knock a knock a knock a thing, that's electric fuel pump. Sure. So, yeah. So. Is it time to make noise? Um. Well, if we, unless oh. unless we got some other stuff to film in here, because it's going to get smoky oh. right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll 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 edit it in after this, but maybe yeah. we'll talk yeah. about some more shop yeah. stuff quick. Okay, so what do we got? We got okay, we got, we got the fuel system. And then we we had to we had to uh, well, part of the fuel system is not having a carburetor on the cylinder. Sure. And so I made some block off plates. And. Uh, and there's one on each cylinder. That's where the carburetors used to go. So, and then they did come with a with a coil that was built right onto the cylinder head, with dual dual plugs on each cylinder. You yeah, know, you that have was, to buy a complete box of plugs every time you change them on this one. That was that Snow Pro only. Did the I don't think the did the LTDs come with the coils some, modeled like that? Some of the LTDs and possibly what was it a 540 they had. Yeah, the interceptor. The yeah, the interceptor maybe have it too, but I think there okay. was one other model that used that. But this, this at the time, this was, you know, of course, Articat had used dual plug heads. Yeah. And it's proven to make more power. So. Hmm. Yeah. So, that's the last of the intake problems or system, and then of course then there's electrical. You know, you got wires coming from each coil. Uh, they go to the box, or they don't go to the box. They, they're triggered from the individual pickups inside here. 
And then, of course, there's lighting. There's two lighting coils inside that goes down, charges the battery. The, uh, that box down there is for the electric power steering. Oh, sure. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. And then uh, exhaust system. And I say, wow. Is it is five that... stingers sticking out of this is not going to be very cool. <laughs> so, I built the I built the uh, exhaust header for it. It's not what you'd call a tuned exhaust, but it starts right here, and it the tube is blocked up. There's a main a main tube here, and that starts right here. Okay. It starts here, and then of course this header goes into it. This one goes into it. it comes around the corner all the way around and then it dumps out here and it goes into it, there's a hole in the fuel tank with a with an aluminum tube welded into it sure. and the exhaust pipe goes through that under the seat and there's a tuned exhaust pipe underneath the seat there that, is a tuned pipe in this well there's an expansion chamber okay and then that goes into uh, a racket box in the back with five individual exhausts. That's great. And a parachute, just in case and anybody just, ever wants to speed run. Just in case you want to, you know, throw a monkey wrench into the guy behind you. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little interesting thing on, uh, on those tubes. I can show you here quick. I had these on there. I had made some stainless steel okay uh tubes with a flared end on them and there's five of these sticking out there and i sent a picture to brad it says it really looks cool he says but i'd like to have them look like like a like a pa speaker you know where it's got a rectangular and and i go okay i just got this done you know <laughs> and so i screwed them all back out of they just they just screw in you know they're pipe threaded yeah and uh, okay what do i do now so I made a buck out of a piece of steel out of the junk. <laughs> and I put this in the press with a, with a fitting on it, you know, so it couldn't distort the threads. Put that in there and push this down with, with the press. And that's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> that is ingenious, Paul. That's it great. Worked. And he, he was ecstatic. He thought that yeah. was, it was, and it does. It looks a lot better than just five round tubes you know paul i would have thought you'd cut and welded and ground and polished that's so clever versus spending all that time yeah no you know time is money yeah and it wasn't my money so you still got to be <laughs> careful you know yeah. i don't i don't tr tend to rip anybody off i i make things that you know not too many people make so that's why they come to me. That's a that's an understatement that not too many people make it. Yeah, I'll put this away. So the the chassis was built by Al Eno, the engine by me, and some of the other you know systems or whatever on there. And then um, the chassis was built for snowmobile engines. So Ben's big Bertha is sitting on top of there. We he had to uh, redo. I think these are these are automotive, they're QA1 shocks for a car. Wow. Yeah, and uh, that was all from Jim Costa at Performance. Jeez, Performance Concepts. Excuse me, Jim. <laughs> yeah, well, I haven't seen him for a long time. So, um, anyway, so Jim went through and redid a lot of the uh, the suspension parts and fabricated like finished up some of the cooling things that I didn't have done because Brad really wanted to get it together for the show in, in uh, St. Germain where it made its de debut. Mm -hmm. And we fired it up there and ran it. And it was awesome. It was a, it was a very cool moment in my life. So. That's cool. I, the best I, of show. Can you imagine? <laughs> I did see it run at St. Germain once. Yeah. It, the sound is incredible. Yeah. It, it's got its own noise. That's for sure. Yeah. Hey Paul, I've been I've been making an observation and see if I guessed right or wrong. I noticed all these set screws. Is each of these at the high point of the cooling jacket for that cylinder? 
You, you guessed correctly. <laughs> That's the bleed air out of the cylinders out of the cooling system. Cool. So these are little mini pipe plugs. So. Sure. Yeah, just unscrew them, let the water start dribbling out, tighten them down, and your air is bled out. Neat. So, and it's got a, it's got a catch can. Well, this is this is the main cooling tank, and then there's a catch can next to it. It's all set up. Braided lines. I mean, it's well, set up pretty nice. Most people would have a rubber hose to their catch can, but not Paul. Well, yeah. yeah. What do you do? <laughs> That's awesome. Hell yeah. Paul's getting ready to fire it up. He's giving it just a little squirt. He put some gas in it. You want to choke it? Um, let's just see if it if it fires without the choke. Oh, let's give it some more. gas paul that's awesome and i've never heard a snowmobile that sounded like that before no needs a little tuning yet but that's to come the the, so. the other thing that amazes me is it's not deafening like i didn't immediately try to cover my ears uh, tommy's oh, yeah. triple with stinger pipes is oh yeah way louder than this it's actually pretty quiet i'm sure you can't tell that on the on the video though no that that'll oh here and it smells wonderful in here right now, people. It smells like race gas and two-stroke oil. <laughs> so uh, yeah. look at that cloud. Yeah. That's how you foul 10 spark plugs at once. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I think I got to go buy a box of plugs for Paul, folks. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Oh, I was going to show you. There's the crank crankcase open. Oh geez, let's uh, let's zoom in and see if people can see that. That that is so wild. I had no idea how those worked. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's the ignition system. Pertronics. Yeah. I recognize it. Yep. Wow. Wonderful stuff. That is wonderful. That is wonderful, Paul. Cool. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a there's a couple more right there. Is a good picture of of the induction system. That's with the old Weber carb on there. With yeah. the Weber carburetor. Yeah. Neat. What we got down here? Just running it. I think they they got it on the stand. I think they're working on suspension. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Is there a peep? there might be a picture of the exhaust? What is the suspension fabricated out of? It's probably a Z or something. Yeah. Everybody's got a Z suspension on their stuff. Yeah. I just can't get this apart. There it is. That's the exhaust system. It's under the seat. So. It's not what you call tuned, but it's got an expansion chamber. Do you need to be tuned when you got that many cylinders? No, you just got to have a seat heater. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Heated seat. Yep. Cool. Okay. 
So huge thanks to Paul for hosting us today. It was great. It was awesome visiting with you. Really appreciate the tour, the knowledge, and uh, all the other things we saw besides sleds. Uh, we had some good discussions on some car items, some other motorcycle and engineering items. And uh, some of those might make it to videos on my channel. Some of them will undoubtedly end up getting edited and sent over to Paul to put up on his channel. And speaking of Paul's channel, Paul's channel is called growth tuning bud snow king as you can see there and uh he's got a lot of great stuff he's got some more videos of this radial engine running which is really cool and he's got a lot of videos of the historic 80s and 90s bud snow king uh, you know racing and interviews and things like that so uh Please go over, check out Paul's channel, subscribe, give him a like, and enjoy the stuff on there. Um, so with that said, huge thanks to the patrons. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, for those that don't know, the patrons keep the channel going with a small monthly donation. And in return, as you can see, they get their names up on the screen. And they get some videos that the rest of the world doesn't see. And they get to watch those uh, patron-only videos as well as every video early and ad free on the patron uh, app or web page. So uh, if you want to support the channel, go sign up for that. Uh, there's other ways to support us as well. There is a PayPal if you want to send a one-time donation. So uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the trails.